Hi, everyone. So pretty soon, Outrage and Optimism is going to be taking our annual break just for a month in January. But we will be back a month later at the beginning of February with season three. And we want to make this the best season of Outrage and Optimism we've ever had. And to do that, we need your help. We are collecting feedback at the moment from people who listen to the podcast and can help us improve it. All the details of this listener survey are in the show notes. And I would say we've already had some very helpful feedback that I got in a voice message from a listener this week. So let's just listen to that now. Really wonderful. I wonder who it is. Hi there. It's Richard Walker, Managing Director of Iceland, purveyor of frozen peas and stubborn optimist. I listen to the podcast every single week. I love it. It's an endless source of ideas and inspiration. However, I do have one big request. Please, can Paul stop singing? Other than that, keep up the great work, guys, and thank you. I will never, (laughs) ever stop singing, but thank you for your feedback. We are just a switching station for our listeners, so as long as you're not driving a big stake through our hearts, please tell us what you would like to hear more of and how we can help. Paul will be at your house tomorrow to serenade you, Richard. Everybody else, we really hope that you will provide your feedback. We so appreciate it. Season three is coming in 2021. We want to make it the best we've ever done. Please go to the link in the show notes. Here's the episode. Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Ravik Karnak. I am Cristiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. <laughs> this week, we discussed the Paris Effect five years since the adoption of the Paris Agreement. We speak with Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation and, of course, architect of the Paris Agreement. And we have incredible music from AJR. Thanks for being here. So it's kind of a big week this week, right? I mean, we don't want to spend all of our time looking back, but sometimes it's important to realise that moments happen that change the course of human history, and five years ago, one of them did. The Paris Agreement was adopted 12th of December 2015. That is tomorrow, if you're listening to this podcast, on the day of release. And there will be a big event with world leaders hosted by Boris Johnson and the Secretary General of the United Nations to look at how the world can now pivot back to climate and really get back on top of this issue in the next 12 months before COP26. But just before we get into all of that, um, I don't know if you know, but one of the co-hosts of this podcast was actually the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC when the Paris Agreement was adopted. So let's turn to her now. Christiana Figueres, how are you feeling? Well, well, I'm feeling like I want to make a little correction to what you said, Tom. Sorry about that. (laughs) Why change the habit of a lifetime? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, why change the habit? Uh, you said um, that this ambition summit uh, yeah. is meant for the world to pivot back to climate. I differ in that opinion. Oh. I don't think we've actually lost focus. I think what has happened is that we've all been, uh, you know, so obsessed with COVID-19 up and down. But the fact is, that the global economy has continued to decarbonize through our obsession period. Mm. And it is really quite impressive what has happened over the past 12 months that we've spoken about on this podcast, but also as uh, as a very, very helpful study that had just came out from Systemic, which has that beautiful title, beautiful, I think, um, The Paris Effect. Because what the study Mm. is saying is... Because there was such a unanimous agreement on what the pathway for the global economy is going to be from here to 2050, because of that clarity of the direction and because of the insertion of every five year touch point to see where we are, the fact is that the real economy has actually matured sector by sector. And I find fascinating their analysis of which sector is maturing quickest. So they identify what we already know intuitively that the power sector has matured the renewal into renewable energies, displacing fossil fuels quickest and will be actually very mature by 2030. Then comes the electrification of transport that 
honestly, I mean, tell me the truth. Five or 10 years ago, did you not think of electric vehicles as anywhere close to science fiction? Yeah. <laughs> it's not science fiction anymore, right? Yeah. We see more and more vehicles um, on, the, on, on the streets, and, and especially we see increasing demand for electric vehicles, certainly light transport, and more and more car companies turning over to that. And then not just light transport, but heavy transport. With the advent of green hydrogen, we see now trucks and buses coming along. That is also maturing the decarbonization of that sector. Um, now, we also thought, frankly, five or 10 years ago, in fact, even just five years ago, we thought, well, it's okay if we're gonna generate electricity from renewables, the sun, the wind, they're kind of cutesy, but you know, we're never going to get to those hard to abate sectors. Those are just going to be the bane of our existence. Well, folks, not so. The fact is that shipping, the um, oil, and, oil and gas, methane, steel, cement, chemicals, they are all already in the process of beginning their in investment into the technological transformation, and they will be well on the path to decarbonizing by 2030. So not everything is going at the same pace. Think of it as fast lanes, medium speed lanes, and slow lanes, fine, according to the difficulty of decarbonization. But the fact is all lanes moving in the same direction. That is something that honestly, five years ago, we would we did not believe was possible within five years. We thought, okay, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. But five years, the progress that we've had, unthinkable is what we thought. Now, as we know, impossible. Who's going to finish the sentence for me? <laughs> impossible is the reality that we're facing and there's nothing we can do about it. No way! <laughs> Tom, you are so oh, yes, fired. Oh, God, you are so know. fired from this podcast. <laughs> Sorry, Christiana, Impossible I think I know it pretty well. Is it not is a fact. a fact. It's an attitude. Oh, no, and it? we can change that attitude. Exactly. But the fact exactly. is, we're even changing more than our attitude, right? We're changing reality. And that's the important part. Yeah. Okay, so here's my little tiny weedy Paris story. Um, uh, I was there uh, with, a, with a very nice uh, position. I was very proud and honoured. And the gavel came down. And I just, you know, apart from everyone standing up and crying for about a month um to hear the speeches that followed a little speech from china saying this is great the usa saying this is great russia saying this is great saudi arabia saying this is great brazil saying this is great it went on and on and on and the whole world came together and everything changed and turned a corner and i just want to sort of call out the genius of the paris agreement um I was actually listening to Tim Flannery, who's wrote that book, The Weathermaker. It's an interesting yeah. person. But he was saying like, oh, it's all about this conference coming up in Glasgow. And of course, that is incredibly important. But the genius behind the Paris Agreement is that everyone's involved in a race, a race to zero, in fact. And people, as you said, Christiana, can move at different speeds and you can up their ambition and you can decide how much, how much you want to be push your economy to be a 21st century economy, whether you want to kind of command and then have leadership in these incredible new technologies. But the point is, everyone's involved. And yes, we've mentioned COVID as drawback. And there's this kind of crazy thing. What's his name? The uh, former current, you know, what a president just about to go from the White House. He, he, he was something, something <laughs> Paris, but Biden's in, the EU in, Japan's in, China's in, and it's beautiful. <laughs> That's a great analysis. I love that. It's beautiful. Now, I have to recount, I rem I'm so glad you told that story, Paul, because I remember, I mean, I was so privileged when the Paris Agreement was adopted. I was sitting there in the front with my friends, Paul Dickinson and Nigel Topping. Um, and, um, and then, of course, the gavel came down, you know, everyone was excited. And then, you know, as Paul said, the speeches came. And there's 190 something countries in the world. And so after like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, Nigel and I left and we thought, you know, this is done. We're going to go and get a beer and go to a party. And came back an hour later and Paul Dickinson was still sitting there in an increasingly empty hall right at the front, tears pouring down his face. And I said, we're going to go to the party in town. Do you want to come? And he goes, no, this is fascinating. I'm going to stay here. And he stayed there for hours late into the night, which is amazing because it sort of demonstrates how emotional and beautiful it was when you are aware of what you're seeing.
Um, but Christiana, I want to go back to something you said because you sort of talked about the transition that's unfold unfurled since 2015. Um, are you surprised by what's happened? Because you know, it's sort of in a way, Paris was obviously a clear signal to the world around how things were going to change, but it was far from guaranteed, right? And and it's it's very difficult to sort of to know what happens next at these critical moments. Has it exceeded your expectations? You know, what a good question. Um, I think the only comparison that I have, Tom, is uh, you, you and I are both parents and we're both very proud parents because, you know, like most or all parents, we just think we have the best kids in the world. Um, and you always have these huge expectations and hopes and desires for them. But then there is at least once a day, there's this knot in your stomach that you go, oh, what, what if they don't make it? You know, and, and then you and, and, and then you can't breathe for a few minutes. And, and that is, you know, the way I feel about this. Yeah. Way back in 2015, there was, you know, huge hope, desire and, um, and, and, and in fact, even trust and confidence that we were going to be moving down the decarbonization path for many reasons. But uh, I think fundamentally because we understood the power of economics, the power of prices dropping, the power of policy, the power of shifting capital. And we knew that all of that was underway. We also firmly believed it because frankly we can't do otherwise right this is the only option that we have if we want to call ourselves yeah, 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 responsible yeah. adults but then there are moments and you go oh and what if not and so I find myself you know sort of caught between those two things constantly most of the day I would say 23 and a half hours a day I'm like yes 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 we're going to do this because and I you know I have my long list of reasons why we're going to do this but honestly if I'm totally honest with you there is those 30 minutes that come up and go oh my god oh my god what would I say to my grandchildren if we don't make it and so I just think that that's realistic about life, right? That, that yeah. we're caught here between this confidence and this excitement. You know, I, I think this week, what has pervaded everything that has to do with climate is just huge excitement at the individualized recognition of what has happened, but especially at the compounded realization of what has happened in the past five years. But then we would just not be humans if we didn't also get a little pang and go, oh, but it's not enough. You yeah. know? Yes, this is incredibly exciting. Progress is really, truly beginning to be exponential. But we're not there yet. Yeah. And so, you know, there you are, the combination of the two. But the mechanism has worked better than, we th than, than some thought, right? I mean, you know, the fact that this idea of a long-term goal combined with short-term targets that are within political terms of office and that those short-term targets are periodic and they provide time for technology to improve for public opinion to change so far and it's only been five years the fact that we left paris with pledges that took us to three degrees and now not necessarily enshrined in nationally determined commitments but rolled up into pledges as we've talked about in this podcast before we're now nearly at two degrees that suggests that that combination of a big beacon of a long-term vision combined with short-term tangible goals for the next few steps in front of you could be a mechanism that unlocks managing long-term systemic risks that are difficult to get your arms around. And if that does prove to be the case, then that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there were so many brains at work on this uh, and collectively we came up with this formula, if you want, of the combination of the long-term target plus this ratchet mechanism or every five-year touch point to see where we are, to be on a constant improvement pathway. Um, and in theory, as we thought about it, you know, the theory hmm, that might really work because it was it's totally different from what we had before under the Kyoto yeah. Protocol, totally, radically different. And so we thought, huh, that might work in theory. You know, we thought, oh, this is definitely worth trying. That might work. Now, the excitement, I think, of this week is that actually the reality of what we're seeing is even more powerful than the theory. Yeah. And 
that's what is so exciting, that not only was the theory correct, but that it's more powerful than that theory that we came up with or that formula, that combination. Tom, Christiana, I have a little bit of experience over 18 years of actually having corporations report annually. Uh, Now, nations are much bigger and, and they report every five years through Paris. But what I've learned is this amazing, a whole bunch of different things can happen. And this is what I predict with Paris. First of all, the Paris Agreement, I believe, is probably like an Olympic stadium. And actually, the nations will start competing with each other to see who can kind of get the the, the success that will come with, uh, uh, um, you know, being the first and the best and the fastest to achieve this technological breakthrough. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is over time, a whole ecosystem builds up and the venture capitalists and the technologists and the bankers and the fund managers and the analysts, they all come together and they start doing the numbers. And we've seen how renewable energy companies suddenly have these incredible valuations and fossil fuel companies have been declining in their impact. And then thirdly, I think it just creates a spirit in in business and society and culture. It helps define ambitions and it becomes a a machine that kind of feeds itself uh, and and, and, and kind of the success of the process um, gives it fuel. It's just a a wonderfully um, iterative and and, and, uh, kind of endless process that should keep accelerating until we get where we need to go. I hope and believe it will. Now, Christiana, you talked earlier about many Paris having many architects, but one of the principal ones, of course, was Laurence Tubiana. Uh, who, indeed, indeed. <laughs> who was the ambassador, the special representative for climate for the French government in the lead up to COP21. Um, obviously, deep experience in this space for many years prior to that and has now left and runs the European Climate Foundation and has just done an incredible job of leading that organisation to more and more impact. Um, sadly, I was a bit ill when you talked to Laurence the other day, so I couldn't join you, but um, I'm sure this is a fantastic conversation. And here we go with Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation and architect of the Paris Agreement. Laurence, how delightful to have you on Outrage and Optimism. Honestly, we have been really looking forward to having you on our podcast. And of course, this is the anniversary episode of the Paris Agreement. And so who else to uh, to celebrate with us the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement? So thank you very much. I am sure everyone and their grandmother wants you uh, to tell the story of the Paris Agreement. So thank you, thank you, thank you for for taking the time for us. Laurence, I would love to take you back a moment to December 2015. The terrorist attacks, the terrible, painful, horrible terrorist attacks on Paris have just happened. They have killed 130 people. They have wounded almost 500 people. Paris, the whole of France, in fact, the whole world, is in utter shock and grief. On the climate change side, we have worked very hard to have a pretty decent draft text that is a very good basis, but that still needs a lot of high-level political work. We are trying to decide what happens in the state of high, high alert that Paris is in. What what happens here? We've We've actually converted an airport into an international conference center. You, Laurence, are hopping around because you've had an accident. You're hopping around uh, and wearing shoes. What do you call those shoes, Laurence? Well, those shoes you definitely made vogue during those many months that you were wearing them. Um, By the time Paris came around, I saw many other people imitating your shoes um, and wearing them. But, you know, what, what a start. What a start. You have everyone in full alert. You have... Uh, a uh, the 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 infrastructure ready. Uh, we have invited 
all heads of state. We know that 150 of them are coming. And, and yet we are in this terrible situation of the Paris terrorist attacks. Laurence, can you, can you go back to, you know, even before we descended upon Le Bourget for the conference, can you go back to the last few days of that deliberation of the French government? Do we go forward with this conference or do we cancel it because of the high alert? I remember that meeting. We were, there was several ones, but one particularly dense and tense. We were together with the Ministry of Home Security, uh, Laurent Fabius, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ségolène Royal, and others. And we were around this table with this beautiful uh, building, the beautiful office uh, of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is a sort of, uh, you know, very golden type of official buildings in France. And Beautiful building. And then that, that was this, oh, and there was, of course, very different views. And um, why go? We should cancel. We should postpone. And uh, what finally prevailed in that meeting, I remember we were all very tense, was how how we can give hope, how we cannot mm. we look to the future with hope. And if we cancel, if we just submit to terrorism, if we just submit to this terrible vision of what life is and what um, brotherhood is and what society is, so we submit to that and we don't go ahead. It's about really not only liberty, of course, and freedom, it's about just innocence in the hope. And that finally prevailed. Even with, of course, everybody traumatized with the security measures, how we will handle that. And um, it was a moment where we decided we should still bet on the hope. And we, I think we came to the conference and, and the leaders came to the conference and it was, it was this big march in Paris with many coming, many leaders coming, Angela Merkel together with François Hollande, Barack Obama coming to say, we should look to the future with hope. And you know, in my view, it was a, an incredible factor of mobilization, of focus on, in a way, sense of responsibility we could not escape that responsibility in front of this horror. And that gave a lot sort of gravity to everyone. And so I think we, finally, this has, you know, like seriousness and gravity. You don't play with that. We have to go ahead. That's what I remember very, very clearly. The sense of gravitas that has, you know, imposed on our centers. But that was gravitas, but with hope. We were betting for the hope. Do you think, Laurence, I was, uh, I remember being under the impression or perhaps because it was communicated to us that actually the number of heads of state who came, breaking all records, never before have we had anywhere under one roof, 150 heads of state under one roof in one day. Um, do you think that was in part because they all came to give their political impetus to the burgeoning agreement, but also out of solidarity to France and precisely to be part of that stand against violence and for hope, against the evil forces in society and for the solidarity uh, in society. Do you think there was a component of that also? I'm sure, Christiana, because in a way, um, it was not a, a just like a formal decision to come, like we have to come, like you come to the UN, when there is, of course, a General Assembly. It was not. So it was something of a decision of these leaders to come. And, and I'm sure they came because uh, at one moment of crisis in history, of course, you can decide many different attitudes. But the attitude to say we, we cannot 
again, submit to evil. Uh, we cannot just let them do, let them go, and and without any sense of the agency, we have to combat the major mm. crisis to come. And so, climate came in with uh, as a as a moment where. This climate crisis, which of course was perceived with different ways by different leaders, but together with a sense of against evil and terrorism, there is no two voices, there is one voice. And I, I do think that that was a major reason for them to come to Paris. And we, you feel that, you feel the solidarity. And all, of course, began their speeches by the reference to this solidarity. Yes, yeah. Um Laurent, so now let's fast forward a little bit precisely to that high-level segment, uh, which uh, unusually so for the UN tradition was held in the first week. Usually the high-level segment is delayed to the last week, uh, but the decision had been made uh, quite a while before that the high-level segment, i.e. that the presence of heads of state would be at the beginning of the two weeks what feelings, what feelings were taking over you as we all stood there uh, uh, outside and greeted all of the heads of state uh, coming in in high protocol fashion um, <laughs> into, into Le Bourget? What, what was the feeling that was invading you as you saw them all march in? An enormous pressure, <laughs> an enormous pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, because I, I was not the one in the protocol. I was the one looking at everybody coming and, and in a way, the sense that you have to deliver. You have to deliver. Mm. Uh, and, and frankly, we remember Christiana. Yes, we had a good text. It has 900 or more or less brackets. Uh, I think that f between 900 and 1,000, it was a very sort of messy one in a way. And and then uh, the, the pressure to say, okay, they come in the beginning, that was a very good and wise decision anyway to be taken. Uh, so they give the input, they, but they are demanding the result. They are there to say, after these 15 days, you better have the result because we we have to come to say, do it. So mm. I felt the enormous pressure at that moment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, and it's especially Laurence, I, I think, you know, many of us were thinking about Copenhagen, uh, December 2009, when uh, heads of state did come. And uh, and it was actually a huge political and procedural debacle. And so it, I think all of us were joined in the pressure of uh, of of contributing to something that was t radically different to uh, to Copenhagen. Um, but just for listeners, you use the word brackets, which is a very important word for those who negotiate. <laughs> brackets in a text means that the word or the words or the phrase, or sometimes the whole paragraph, uh, which is in brackets, it has been put in brackets by one country or by many because they don't agree to it. And you cannot adopt a text, which is what was adopted at the end of Paris, with a single bracket in it. So you need to be able to negotiate with every single country, 195 of them, uh, the changes and the nuances in within those brackets that make the text there palatable. And, um, and, and, and the challenge there, Laurence, as you will remember better than anything, is sometimes you have to negotiate one bracket against another bracket or three brackets or four brackets, you know, uh, and keep all of that in, uh, in, in, in your head. Um, so, so let's walk into that process, uh, Laurence. We could, I'm sure you're, you, you have an excellent memory and you could talk to us for, for days about moments, but can you choose um, a moment in which, uh, let's first start with joy, okay? Let's choose one, one moment that you remember in which something finally came through that you thought, aha, this really could detonate a lot of progress throughout the process. What was one 
one, one, one piece, you know, it's almost like taking a knot and pulling the, uh, the miraculous string that holds everything in knot and then things begin to move. Um, and, and then we'll get to the difficult parts, but do you remember one piece where you felt an enormous sense of relief? Uh, and just to come back a little earlier, these these brackets you explain clearly, uh, it's like having 1,000 pieces of disagreement. So you think of how I can get so many pieces of disagreement to come together. And um, and maybe different moments. Um, I think the first moment I feel it was really possible so we had this after the first week and the discussion between diplomats, you know, that the moment where the presidency takes over saying, well, we are there, we still are very, so we don't have found exactly uh, agreement on these 1,000 pieces, so let's try another method. And um, <clears throat> we began to <clears throat> to have a a discussion with the whole very talented people who have been writing these paragraphs and these phrases. And we sit down with them in a little room and say, look, where do you see there is a really serious disagreement? And we went again and again through all the text with different people, different groups, but mainly the one of who have been so instrumental in writing with their own words. So after, uh, after just talking to all these people, you know, almost one by one, we saw that finally all these disagreements, these sometimes conflicts, were not finally that important. And one by one, you see the, you make the difference between the essential and the anecdotal of the difference. And, um, and then we began to propose to clean up, to really go to the essential with the first draft of the text. And I remember very well, Christiana, you told me, you have three chances. Uh, you can present three versions, but no more than that. So you can have a process where you progressively come to an agreement, but you don't have that many chances. You have three. And so presenting the first one, tabling the first one, chance, taking the first chance, was a very impressive moment because we knew exactly if we lose that one, there is only two left. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and remembering, of course, all the time Copenhagen would like, be there as well. And uh, so, you know, dramatic frustrations. And so it was a wonderful moment when we brought these texts with, again, trying to say these are the essential disagreement and we took all, we took out the more non-essential ones and do you agree that that distinction we made we made the choices that these are the very important ones we have to continue talking about and debating around and these other ones are really minor discussions and we are in faced with a very big problem so we have to concentrate on the essential and then from a sudden, everybody applauded to that. That was an incredible moment where you finally, pe people just began to say, we trust you for the choices. You, we trust you, you are, you are not sort of cheating us. Uh, yes, this is an essential piece. And okay, this, this disagreement were finally very minor ones. So that was a, as is the moment what we say, we can do it. That was exactly the moment that I thought we could do it. Mm. You know, Laurence, um, it's interesting that you put it that way because the image that I had throughout this whole process is the image of a sculptor that takes a beautiful piece of stone, but that looks like a stone and the, and the, um, the craft and the magic and the art of the sculptor is to begin to remove from the stone everything that is not the sculpture. Uh, in order to reveal at the end only the sculpture. And there's a lot of stone that has to be removed very carefully, chiseled away, um, in order to reveal the, the sculpture. And so that's sort of the image that I have of that whole process. 
um, of precisely removing with with a chisel, with care, with diligence, but but also with a lot of courage. Because once you remove it, right? Once you remove it, it's gone, and you have to have everyone agree with you on the removal of those pieces that, as you say, are non-essential um, in order to come down to the very, very essential. So that was sort of the image. Yes, beautiful, because it was a huge discussion we had with uh, Laurent Fabius, because we could have two choices or try to have the agreement on the first chance, on the, on the big, really the big thing, the, I don't know, the finance, uh, the responsibilities, uh, the, well, you know, these very big political things. And there was this option, we go straight to the core of the problems, uh, the core, and we try to find an agreement now, and then the rest we will do that after, or just take that process through, and pe- bring that through the process, the different, all these people uh, along. <clears throat> and when, so... I think I, I convinced him that it was better to go this way because that was building the trust progressively that, again, people would have the time to make their choices and to design the sculpture at the end exactly how they see it appearing. Mm. So it was just yeah. a big anxiety because you, you don't know if they would look, if that the, the, the evidence of the form you are trying to show is the right one. That was the first mm-hmm. chance. Uh, right, <laughs> and and you can you can miss it. It, it may look ugly to everyone, but finally <laughs> they felt it was it was okay. So I think in, in that famous phrase, this is how the the sausage is made uh, regarding uh, politics and and this international agreement. But if I can just make an observation. Um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, although these are technical details. Um, you are two truly great global leaders who managed a fiendishly complex ecosystem of nations and an ego system of leaders to deliver the landmark uh, global turning point on climate change. And the world will always owe you a debt of gratitude. And it feels right to take a moment just to honor that extraordinary achievement. Which leads to my question, what can you share about the nature of your leadership that helped to deliver this extraordinary and deeply necessary achievement? Well, I I think I, you know, there are different techniques of diplomacy. I'm not a professional one, by the way. Huh? I just did that because I was, I thought it was, I could help. And, but I think there is different styles. There is a style where you are candid to a point that people first begin not to believe you because that's not possible. You are so candid. And in a way, it forces you after a certain time and always speaking the truth to people and, again, Mm. with the stubbornness in in being candid, that people, in a way, that's a surprise for for them. No, they are surprised. They are, in a way, displaced a little bit of their normal way of working or normal way of thinking. Um, and so that's first, I think, being candid. You know, I love that because candid and diplomacy are not two things that sort of fall into the same phrase. <laughs> and so I agree with you that being candid and being transparent uh, and being very frank with negotiators c- catches them a little bit by surprise. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so oh, yeah, so they look at you and, and of course, in big meetings, they don't believe you that that's normal. No, that's the that's the rule of the game. But then they they begin to look at you and progressively, oh yes, so she may. And then that then that of course that changes their mindset, which uh-huh. is of course everything is about changing the mindset of others, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then the second thing is, which I don't know how I can communicate that, but you know what was happening really impressive in Paris is that all these diplomats representing their national interests, that's, that's their jobs, that's their Monday, at one point in time, they grew outside of it. Uh, they, they, they thought bigger than that. They feel that finally the real interest of their nation, the real interest of their people 
was beyond the traditional uh, script they were normally producing. And that was an extraordinary moment. I felt that that communication of truth and trust in them create the fact that they, yes, they, they, they were bigger than their normal role, their normal way. They began to be really, I don't know, I can express that people, not professional. People relating to something bigger than them, than themselves, than, than exactly the script T- they have normally. Touching their humanity. I would say touching their humanity and touching the humanity of each other. Exactly. And I have a, a beautiful anecdote on that in particular, which I think I shared already Please. with, with Christiana Shunshundi knows that story. It was a, the last, last day. It was 5.30 a.m. And, you know, we were presenting the, the final text. We have been drafting uh, with all these steps. And uh, this culture was then done. And then there was no way to change it anymore. And so we, we, we went from different groups to different groups, explaining without showing them the text, because that you have to show that to everybody at the same time. But just to take, not take them by surprise and explaining to them what was good for them, what was the traditional things they were looking for, and the piece they would not like anyway, because that was not what they were looking for. And just explaining what they were winning and what they were losing in a way, again, in a very transparent way. And then I, I, I got this meeting with a, well, the difficult countries, you know, the countries that are living from the oil and gas, mm-hmm. uh, countries who see their development, their economic development still with a lot of emissions. And then it was, there were all these ambassadors, very sort of trained diplomats, very cold, cold faces. And, um, I sit there explaining what they would like, what they would certainly strongly dislike. And then a silence came in, an icy silence. And then, you know, I was exhausted. I haven't slept for really, really by a week or more. And then I began to cry. And I just was exhausted. And I told them, you know, I cannot do better. I I just can't do that, but I cannot I cannot do better than that. I think it's a more balanced thing. It's a more, but I cannot do better. Again, silence. And then one by one, they stood up. They came to me. They took me in their arms and said, we trust you. We trust you. You did your best. We will do that. It was a moment of incredible emotion. These were, again, super trained, super competent diplomat. They, they have been doing that since years and years. And then from a sudden, they said, we trust you. So mm. it's an image I would never, never beautiful, forget. Beautiful, beautiful moment. beautiful story. How, to, how you, you got people out of themselves and their jobs into something bigger. I, I hope people will, will study for 100 years. It was a miracle and it's a beautiful story with a very happy ending. And then, you know, Paul, it's exactly Paris Agreement and the climate and fighting climate change with, with the text or without the text. The problem is not this one. Is is really beyond beyond themselves. Is really uh, yes. growing. That's exactly the point. That's exactly where you shift from a defensive position to really addressing the issue. And that was humanity really humanity standing up and and yeah. i saw that in yeah. their eyes in their in their arms that was really an incredible uh and one was uh what i would remember all my all my life uh, an iranian diplomat very nice person he was standing a little shy saying i don't dare to take you in my arm but i sing it very strongly so it was very <laughs> nice <laughs> How, what a beautiful story, Laurence, mm. and, and as you say, very symbolic of the process um, that everyone there had to go through in order to get to this unanimous agreement. And as you say, the process that we're still in, the process that we're still in here five years, uh, five years later, um, because it is, as you say, that we have to step away from our short-term thinking, our... Um, uh, geographically bounded and economy bounded thinking and really 
move toward, uh, I would say, an enlightened, still self-interest, but an enlightened self-interest that focuses more on the very predictable long-term uh, than the evident short-term. So um, a, a beautiful a beautiful example of stepping out of that onto a bigger platform. Um, Laurence, and, and in that in that vein, here we are five years after that fantastic moment when Laurent Fabius was finally uh, told, yes, he can bring the final text to the floor and he brings his gavel down. Um, and here we are uh, five years later. So I am sure that everyone this week has been asking you, Laurence, is the Paris Agreement alive? Or is it dead? Are we moving forward or are we still stuck? Um, where are we? And, um, and, and the way that I would love to invite you to frame that, Laurence, is as, as you well know, our podcast is called Outrage and Optimism because we think we have to be outraged about what we haven't done yet um, and optimistic about what is being done and what more can be done. So could you frame your view uh, and your outlook of uh, five years after Paris and what we see uh, happening around us? Could you frame it into what are you what are, what are you outraged about? Just really totally outraged about? And what are you optimistic about? Starting by the outrage, I am outraged with the cynicism, I must say. Really, I'm outraged by hearing. What a good point! <laughs> oh, that that probably that probably that really make me mad, drive me mad because you see, pe- people who knows exactly what's going on, who have fight again and again to deny what was happening, and I think about certain companies and certain lobbies and are still trying to continue lying or, or, or even worse, paying the, telling they pay a lot of attention, they will really do what is needed, they will change their business model. Uh, and at the same time, still, on the other hand, continuing to develop false science, false communication, fake news to say, no, we should we should be there. We should still continue using oil and gas, and that we cannot do. And finally, uh, all these alternative solutions are not economic, or they are not doable, or they are even more polluting than the old ones. So I I am mad with cynicism. Yeah. I am mad with that. I think the problem is the rest is it's difficult. People struggle. They don't have all the ideas. They may. They, they may face difficulties. There is, of course, any, many... Co- it's not simple to do that deep transformation. I can understand the difficulties. I can understand even people really not doing as much as they could because they face these difficulties. But I, I don't... I cannot accept cynicism. That, that's where I really mm. put my driving map. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, and I was... Uh, you know, there was last... I think that was last year. Yeah, last year or two years ago, the Pope Francis gathered a number of CEOs from many uh, uh, oil mm-hmm. and gas uh, companies. Companies. And, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it was, I think, two years ago. And <clears throat> this incredible leader, and I think he told them, okay, uh, I, I have this discussion, you should do, really, you should really now accept the reality and, and move forward. Uh, but stop funding the climate denialism. Yes. And, that's, <laughs> and that, I think that's something we have to tell them always, no? Stop doing that. Stop being cynical. A pre- we pretty can't. courageous move on his part. Incredible courageous move. Incredible. But that really, uh, uh, we, we have these days uh, leaders that enormous, with enormous courage and speaking exactly to the level of the problem like, the Antonio Guterres or the Pope, is they are really speaking the truth at, at the level we, we should talk about. So, but that, mm. that's good. That's really, that's the optimism part in a way. 
So that drives me mad on the laws. That's the laws. Um, I, I, and, and again, the, which is not really creating outrage, but yes, sentiment that you, these arguments against and against, against short term action to say we have time, we have to deal with more urgent problems. You know, there will be social consequences. People don't want to change. All these arguments just to delay action are really uh, the, the part, yes, of the outrage. But what drives me much more on the optimist side is that on one side, Paris Agreement is, the life of Paris Agreement is exactly what you and, and I, we were expecting. We didn't imagine that there was a big uh, uh, government imposing on others any action. You, we were not believing in any court of justice sanctioning everyone. That was not what's meant to be. Paris Agreement was meant to change the mindset, change the expectation, change the vision of the future that finally, and each actor, each constituency, each element of this big global society takes it on and try and to find the pathway, the travel the, 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 that they can embark on and make their own choices. That's really the philosophy. And then, of course, to try to encourage each other and to peer review and to push and to, to drag. And so this, where I am optimist, is whatever happened with Trump leaving the Paris Agreement with some countries dragging their feet, evidently. But, you know, this is a reference for everyone, meaning the, the guide. So everyone is trial with more or less, of course, candidness, measuring what they do the ben- vis-a-vis this benchmark. That are we consistent yes. with Paris Agreement or not? That's the force exactly. of it. And whatever mm-hmm. is in the details, etc., that's not the problem. Is that the goals... Uh, you remember this last Saturday morning where we negotiate the final goal of Paris, the net zero by, 20, by mid-century, mm-hmm. with this yes. balance, this complicated formula coming from um, <clears throat> previous texts that probably some government didn't understand exactly what it was meant. And then, five years after, everybody's referring to that as mm-hmm. a, the new normality. And this is exactly, you know, that's exactly the value of this. Exactly. Changing the mindset and the sense of instoppability, irreversibility of any way, the, the thing we have to do. And of course, the problem is we're still, still too slow. But this sense of inevitability, I think, is, is really there. Even if there are many people that try, of course, some constituencies that try to really drag the process. But that, I think, what the importance of the agreement is about, is changing yes. the mindset. And the expectation. Changing the mindset, change, changing, as you say, the point of reference, right? Everybody is measuring themselves against the Paris uh, Agreement. Um, it's, it's what I would call the Paris effect. It is really very, very impressive that, uh, that the agreement is having the effect of establishing itself as the reference, as the milestone, as, uh, and, and, and it is it's constantly uh, being used, as you say, as the um, as the comparison. Am I Paris aligned or am I not Paris aligned? Is my portfolio Paris aligned or not? Are my emissions Paris aligned or not? Uh, so that Paris effect of uh, of moving everyone toward that long term goal of net zero by twenty fifty um, is really very uh, very impressive. And as as you say, that was the most difficult and final, final uh, factor to be uh, to be included there. Um, the Paris effect. Laurence, you embody the Paris effect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you so much for what you did during that whole, whole long, difficult year, despite... Uh, your accident, despite your health, despite um, not seeing your family for a whole year. Um, Thank you so much for what you did during those two weeks. And thank you for not abandoning this. Thank you for for staying the course from your seat at the European Climate Foundation and continuing to be such a rudder 
you are both a rudder and a sail, keeping the uh, keeping the the direction going and keeping the speed going with the sail. So thank you, thank you so much, Lawrence. Christiana, being in, unstoppable is exactly what I learned from you. Huh? Unstoppable. <laughs> that, that's your leadership. That's your leadership style. Oh, thank, thank you, you. thank you, Christiana. Thank, thank you, you Laurence, and and happy birthday to the Paris Agreement. Yeah, hey. happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Amazing at this pivotal moment to get a chance to talk with Laurence. I mean, you know, she played such a crucial role as a partner to you and to so many, Christiana. What do you what do you think talking with her again after all these years? You know, it was so nice because the fact is um, that we worked so closely together for that last year. And I do remember that moment, as she said, you know, when she came to Bonn for the first time and we met for the first time. Um, and, uh, and, and we both kind of realized, hmm, we're both women. We're both very small in stature. Um, and we have this big weight on our shoulders <laughs> and, and we really Huge. very quickly, very quickly bonded. And Laurence was so heroic, right? As I said there on that, on that interview, she had so many physical ailments, accidents and, difficulties to walk and she was in wheelchairs throughout the year and she had to change, get off of her high heels and get into basically running shoes that she then made very stylish. Which have become iconic, actually. Yeah, yeah they became very iconic. You know, if whoever makes those shoes should uh, to change the <laughs> branding and call them, you know, to be on our shoes. Um, because I, I then saw many other women uh, in the negotiations wearing those very comfortable and very wise <laughs> uh, and prudent shoes. But she was, you know, an indefatigable. I mean, just absolutely, she knew what her responsibility was as the main worker bee for, uh, for the presidency. Uh, she just worked so, so, so hard throughout that whole year. And then, needless to say, in, uh, in, in the two weeks in Paris. And we found ourselves at all hours of the, uh, of the night uh, bumping into each other in coordination meetings and monitoring meetings. And it was, um, it was quite, uh, qu quite the experience to know that you could depend on each other uh, to get the respective work done. We were each playing different roles, but I knew that I could depend on her to get her work done. She knew that she could depend on me um, and our respective teams. And it was um, quite, uh, quite a beautiful teaming up, I would say. Yeah, and uh, it's not, I can't really think of any time before um, a guest has actually made me cry, but um, she tells the story of having, you know, absolutely hardly any sleep for a week completely sleep deprived being in this room with all of these diplomats who are all very professional and she she, she talks about where they are in the negotiations and she says the room's like ice and there's a silence and then she speaks a bit more about what's happening and the room's like ice in silence and then she says i've done everything i can and then they come up uh, one by one and hug her and say, we trust you. And she spoke about how those diplomats, and I think it's the, the most beautiful part of the Paris Agreement, which is in itself a wonderful, wonderful thing, how they rose out of themselves and became more than national representatives, but rather served their populations as global diplomats. That is a a truly um, inspiring insight and, and shows that capability lives in all of us. And she was a big part of that, right? As, as you were too, Christiana. I mean, I remember being in groups of negotiators who were talking and, and, and creating all kinds of problems on the floor of the negotiations and in rooms. And, and sometimes Laurence's presence would just make them behave better. She'd kind of turn up and they'd all sort of, they'd all kind of slightly behave and the toys would go back in the prams and they'd stop being so, you know, obstreperous, um, which is amazing. It shows you how even in those moments where it seems to be so about 
diplomatic norms and terms, actually it's a human relationship and those human relations. Totally about human relations. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's about more than friendships, right? You, you do get to be friends with all of these people that you work so hard with for such a long time, but it goes beyond just a human relationship or a friendship or getting to know each other. It moves into the realm of touching each other very deeply at, at the root of our humanity. Mm. And I think that is what, you know, Laurence was describing there, that those people, you know, who, who could have been pretty obstreperous, um, they really understood that there was something bigger than themselves, mm. bigger than their national interest, short-term interest, mm. that there's, there's something longer term and bigger than short-term national interest, and that's their long-term national interest that, you know, not surprisingly, we all share because we all share the interest of, uh, of planetary well-being just because we're humans and we depend on planetary well-being. But, you know, that is so easily hidden from sight if you are looking at, uh, at, at the color of the flag in front of you or the title uh, at the front of your door. And so as we go beyond that and we're able to, to really touch each other at the root, at the root of our humanity and truly see how much we have in common, then there's just infinite space for wonderful things to happen. And is it, Christiana, is that ability to touch shared humanity, which was such a fundamental part of that, is that a function of, I mean, it was mainly women who were in the roles of making this stuff happen in Paris. Is that a, is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. I don't think it's a coincidence, but, um, but, but I have to remind you that it wasn't only women who agreed to this, right? <laughs> uh, there were quite a few men in the room that agreed. Um, but the and women so maybe were in charge. We, you know, we just have a little bit more, um, less, uh, let me say this, maybe we have less of a hang up in going into this space and maybe some men with, uh, with the beautiful exception of the two of you and a few other wonderful men, um, they have more of a hang up to move into this space that is beyond the current roles that we're playing. And, um, and to see that we have this shared legacy and shared responsibility. And I guess women, just because we are in our DNA, we're stewards of our kids, of the future, we just gravitate much more quickly into that space. And we don't think there's anything weird about that or silly about that. We actually see the strength in it. Yeah. Um, and I think we were able to um, elicit that same courage of spirit from so many men over those two weeks. It's a miracle. And uh, we've heard astronauts talk about the overview effect. You know, they look out their spaceship and they can't see any of the borders. But I think you managed to have the kind of I view you effect, right, where I, I don't see the, you know, my, my, my competing country's borders, but I see, you know, uh, what's that line from that song? I see people saying, hi, how do you do? Really, they're saying, I love you. Getting some of that, you know, everyone's in the room and you can't really credibly hide behind a separatist interest with a, with, when, you know, when the, the world is, is crying. Hmm. Now, we couldn't have a better piece of music to end this episode with. And this has been great to have this conversation about the past and about the future. And um, apart from anything else, I have to say that getting this band on Outrage and Optimism has been the first time I've had any street cred with my children. And, you know, as you know... Who actually Christian, appeared yeah. and started yeah. interviewing the guests. They, but, they yeah. did appear during the conversation with AJR, which we're about to hear. So, um, so AJR is a US New York based band. It's three brothers and actually their initials, uh, spell out the name of their band. So Adam, Jack and Ryan, um, we actually talked to them. It was fascinating to get a chance to sit down with these three brilliant young men and have a conversation about all of the things they're committed to, not just through their music, but through all of their engagements and all of the ways that they try to make the world a better place. Well, hello, Adam, Jack, Ryan. I want to just start off by thanking you for such beautiful 
moving music and the uh, the genius of creating your own incredible, unique style, which, as you know, has moved millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And all the other work you do, Adam, with sustainability partners and just the whole thing. Now, I've like many of us, like me, Christiana and Tom, we've all worked on climate change for decades, but we've never had what I'm supremely kind of uh, admiring you for, maybe a little tiny bit jealous. You have millions of millions of people. He's really you, very jealous, I would I'm say. I'm very jealous. Thank you, Tom, for correcting me. Like, I'm, <laughs> He's but so in, jealous he can't yeah, even <laughs> speak. <laughs> and but totally on, rumbled by my on, alleged Paul. my alleged colleagues here, like supposed to back me up and support me and tear me down. But it's true, you you know, I mean, it's not easy, I know, but there are millions and millions of people out there that you touch in a, in a fantastic way. And I'd just love to hear from you um, how you work with them and, and, and how, what the journey's been like being kind of like part of your own movement that you kind of created, but also you're, you're, you know, you're, you're supporting so many other things. How's it working with that incredible audience? It's been incredible for us. Honestly, it's been such a long road. I think we, we, I, I, I agree with you. We have such a close connection with the fans and I think it's because we built a lot of this ourselves. I think there's a general feeling when, when something's being shoved down everybody's throats, you're a little apathetic towards it, right? You, you don't really like embrace it fully, but I think we've been able to just like, we made our own record label and we, we, uh, we, we gathered our own publicity team and our own radio team. We kind of did it one step at a time and made one fan at a time, touring the country, touring the world. Um, and when you do it like that, every fan feels like they have ownership over you. And it's so it's, it's a nice kind of very personal connection uh, with the fans. I think we get to uh, have, yeah, a more personal relationship with them, I guess. And what, what, one of the things that's amazed me about listening to your music is, um, you know, th there are some musicians that clearly have a sort of social or environmental conscience, and that kind of is worn on their sleeve to some degree. You don't evidently have that, but if you listen to it, the kind of the message is kind of baked into everything that you're talking about. Is that deliberate? How do you go about constructing meaning in your song? Oh, yeah, great question. Yeah, really good question. It, I think... Um, I think you have to do it subtly. I think uh, when, when you when you bake it into a song, it has to be about you. I think no, everybody's very aware when they're being preached to in yep. in a song, um, mm. and so I think it really needs to be like. Let, let me use an example: uh, "Burn the House Down," our song. It was yeah. our version of a political song because it was uh, when did, 2017, I think we wrote it. Um, right at the, at the time that all of that political stuff was happening, but we couldn't write a song saying, here's what's wrong with the world. It needed to be a personal thing. Here's how I'm affected. It, and it ended up being a song about writing a political song. Like if I write this political song, will they allow me to sing it on Ellen or whatever, you know? And, yeah. and, and so, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Uh, and I was saying, because so many of you know, there are those people in the world that are those tenacious, will lead the pack, those kind of people. But there are a lot of people that are very unsure and don't really know. And we, it, to try to appeal to those people is very smart because you can, you know, you can scroll through your Twitter feed all day and see, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. But a lot of people aren't right. super educated. Like me, for instance, I'm not, I don't know 100% of the answers. I don't know 100% what to do. But if you can relate and try to make people feel it on that level of a little bit of insecurity and unsureness, maybe they'll start to actually mm. listen and do their own research and say, okay, this is actually really important to me. So it's really just about connecting to the fans who have the exact same mindset as you. So like Ryan said, you have to be subtle about it and not preach. It's funny. A lot of my, my work in the sustainability space came from this idea seeing how you get fans involved and excited about something because so much of the climate movement, because I know this is what all three of you work on, has been about this, this fear of the future and this kind of doom and gloom approach. But when I look at the music industry where I spend so much of my time, it's all about excitement. And how do you build excitement one person at a time to get them involved? And so a lot of the work that I've done is taking things that we learned from the music industry and applying them to activism, specifically around climate. You know, you get somebody excited and then they follow you on Twitter or they stream a song and then they buy an album. They buy a ticket to a show. They follow you around the world. It's that ladder of getting people engaged in something. And a lot of my work is how do we take that and apply that to things like climate? I love the idea that you're meeting people where they are, though. Now, Christiana. I want to riff off that... Um uh, where you both were talking about, it's about getting people excited with you. And I, everything that we've talked about until now is actually politically correct conversation. I'm going to veer off into the <laughs> not politically correct <laughs> conversation. Finally. This is where the, this is where Finally, the we're really getting there. Yeah, yeah. 
So, um, so here's what I would love to hear from you. In a recent lecture at Columbia, you referred to the SDGs as sexy. Now, I have to tell you that a year ago, or maybe two, I actually was still the uh, executive secretary of the United Nations Climate Change Convention. And I had a uh, press conference with the Minister of Environment of Japan, a society that is actually pretty but buttoned up, right? And in that conversation, in the middle of the press conference, I heard myself saying, well, I actually think that addressing climate change is pretty sexy. Now, this minister got very excited about this concept and commented on it. I never got a bad rap for it, but he went home and he got hammered for having jumped on my boat and given in public his opinion about this. So I would love to know, neither of you are ministers of environment, none, none of you are Japanese, you belong to a much more, let's say, relaxed culture, but I would love to know, what reaction did you get to that statement? What did you mean by it? And what reaction did you get? So, <laughs> wow, what a question. <laughs> when, I was, when I was talking about, <laughs> when, when I was talking about the SDGs being sexy, I mean, I come from a human rights background and a law background. So the people that I'm normally talking to are so serious when they're listening to things and they're talking about states' obligations for human rights. But when I mention that the SDGs are sexy, it's because all of my studies looking at all these, all these different countries, even though countries are legally obligated to these specific human rights, they've gone above and beyond with incorporating the SDGs. And because there's such interesting icons associated with it, and it's something that countries are not obligated to, they get to participate in them. And I saw that as the difference. And that's one of the reasons why I thought they were sexy. And the other thing is that the SDGs are appearing on clothing. They're appearing in songs. They're appearing all <laughs> over the internet. I have this uh, sweater here that has... The SDG I logo. I have the same on sweater. It. Yeah, I have, yeah. The same. I have yeah. it as a hoodie. Yeah, yeah. But who would think that something having to do with yeah. sustainability, where there's a goal about, you know, urban development, is actually appearing on clothing, and people are excited about wearing it. Okay, so Adam, <laughs> I'm going to come back to you or any 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 of the band, but. Um, Okay, SDGs, for those of you who are not yet familiar with the acronym that we all seem to know without introducing, is the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Now, Sustainable Development Goals don't immediately sound like, uh, you know, the most dramatic Sexy. volcano <laughs> of excitement. Can anybody tell me how the Sustainable Development Goals get people dancing around their front room, as they do to your music every day? That That is a great question. And... The thing that I've been talking a lot about recently is this idea of the micro-influencer. And a micro-influencer is somebody who doesn't necessarily have millions of followers online, but has really strong connections to their friends and family. And something really cool about the SDGs is that there's something for everybody. It really feels overwhelming to think about 17 goals. But if you are really passionate about water and want to focus on one of the SDGs that's focused on water, you can really embrace that and use your micro-influence to teach your friends and your family and even your teachers at school about it. It's so much, it's so much more accessible than anything that the UN has ever put out in the history of being an organization. I, I, I should just point out there that the UN version was not quite that good, but Richard Curtis got his hands on it and then actually it was improved after that. So I appreciate your... your yes, uh, your all, of, all of the visuals of the SDGs are <laughs> Richard Curtis and his team the genius, the genius of this icon, right, uh, that puts out all of those 17. Because honestly, and at the UN, people were saying, nobody's going to remember 17 things. We, you know, at a stretch, we can remember three of something, a list of three, but 17, forget it. So it was Richard Curtis and his genius team that turned this into the icons and the colors that are actually, I'm, I'm not sure that anybody can recite the 17 in chronological order, but we all know, or most people know, that there's 17, that they have different icons, that they have different colors, that it's a rainbow effect. It's, um, it, it was actually quite a stroke of communication genius. It's funny artists, that you mentioned Richard. Save the UN, that's what I call it. Sorry, Adam. No, I was just saying it's funny that you mentioned Richard because Ryan and Jack both study film. 
and they are very involved in film. And Richard Curtis, as a director, comes from a similar place that we do in music. He's using the skills that he built in his entertainment form to help communicate these messages of sustainability. And Jack, I mean, you know, he directed Love Actually and a bunch of these, you know, really famous course, movies. Yeah. Now, we have been, one of the best parts of this podcast has been including music. And we've been doing it for the best part of a year now. And we include emerging artists, um, you know, artists that aren't necessarily well-known usually, unlike yourselves. But we're thrilled to have you on this episode. This is a particularly special episode because it is the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. So mm. it's a big celebration. Um, and actually, there's been some evidence and some data that's come out this week to suggest that despite all expectations and against all um, fears in the world, actually the Paris Agreement is working. And we are now looking at a temperature trajectory that is not yet safe, but is a lot closer to safe than anyone thought it might be. So we've got everything to play for in the coming years. And we'd love it if you could just introduce this song a bit before we play it, because I love it. My daughter, who's here watching with me, absolutely loves it and insisted on us having you on because she's loved you for a long time. Um, could you just give us a bit of an intro to Burn the House Down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but yeah, it's it's very much our version of a political song. It's a little uncertain. It's a little like, who am I in in all of this? And it's, I, th I think, something that we all feel. It's like, how much how much am I the... Uh, the, the figure to stand up and lead the pack or how much am I the figure to kind of follow along with the trend? It's, it's, this whole thing is very human nature, you know, very human condition. Like where do I stand in the pack? So we wrote that and all in tied into this political climate we're in right now. So the name of this song is burn the house down. And I can't think of a better song for this moment. Of course, the meaning of the phrase burn the house down is it's, it's kind of an older phrase, and it means to just do a job and knock it out of the park. You burn the house down, you rip the roof off. And so that's why I think it fits so well here. Of course, the double meaning of it is that right now our home is on fire in climate change. And we are facing a reality where the forests are burning, other natural ecosystems are burning. Of course, that's not what we mean here. What is meant by this song is burn the house down. The reason we think it's so relevant this week is because Paris was burning the house down in all of the positive ways. It's a beautiful song. I really hope you enjoy it. Used to keep it cool, used to be a fool, all about the bounce in my step. Watch it on the news, what you're gonna do? I could eat refresh and forget. Used to keep it cool. Yeah. Should I keep it light, stay out of the fight, no one's gonna listen to me If I write a song, preaching what is wrong, will they let me sing on TV? Should I keep it light? Is that right? I let it go, walk into the show, gawking at the tricks on your sleeve. Too good to be truthful, I'm in a room full of entertainers and thieves. You still let it go. Whoa.
Should I hang my head low? Should I bite my tongue? Or should I march with every stranger from Twitter to get it done? Used to hang my head low, now I hear it loud. Every stranger from Twitter is gonna burn this down. Way up, way up we go. Been up and down that road. Way up, way up, oh no. We gon' burn the oars down. Watch me standing in line. You're gon' least of it lies. You got something to hide. We gon' burn the oars down. Hi, I'm Nolan, covering for Clay this week while he's away. Well, there's another episode of Outrage and Optimism. The song that you just heard is Burn the House Down by AJR. You can check out more of their music by clicking the link in the show notes. Outrage and Optimism is a global optimism production and is produced this week by Clay Carnell and Nolan Rossi. Our executive producer is Marina mencilla Herman. Thanks to the global optimism team, which includes Sarah Law, Katie Bradford, Laura Richardson, Sophie McDonald, Freya Newman, Sarah Thomas, Sharon Johnson, and John Ward. Our hosts are Tom Rivet Karnak, Christiana Fogueres, and Paul Dickinson. Special thanks to our guest this week, Lawrence Tibiana. You can find us online at Global Optimism on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. It helps us if you rate us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Five stars gets the word out about the podcast, and thank you for writing a review to help spread the word. Next week, we'll have another great episode, so hit subscribe, and we'll see you next week.